Washington. Anybody heard of Riderwood, Washington? Oh, yes, a lot of people. You've got a lot of friends here, Russ. And just before Russ speaks, I'd like to ask who's here for the very first time this season? We've got a couple back here. Tell us who you are and where you're from. Carpal Ferris, Edmonton, Alberta. Edmonton, Alberta. And you're the brother and sister Ferris. But we're glad to have you here. Amen. And we've got a couple here that's here for the first time. Ted and Dorothy Proud, also from Edmonton. Okay, well we're glad to have you. The Ferris's and the Prouds? Okay, well we're very we're, we're glad to have you. Amen. And didn't Lola do a wonderful job with that song service? <laughs> Henry DeFooter, I'd love to read about him. And she didn't tell the story about the, uh, about the second song that we had at his. But I know a little bit about that story, and I'll spill the beans just a little bit. During World War I, there was a big song going on. Over there, over there. Tell them to beware that the Yanks are coming. Well, Henry de Fugger heard that and heard that, and he said, well, you know, we're going somewhere, too. We're going over yonder. And, uh, and uh, they can go over there, but I'm going over yonder. Amen. And he wrote that hymn as a response to that. <laughs> wonderful Christian man. And we have a wonderful Christian man right here. My brother, Russ Crumpacker. And uh, we've known him, uh, but we don't know all about him. He's going he's gonna to tell us his, uh, his story, his, his uh, journey with the Lord. And uh, <clears throat> he's a fairly young Adventist. A fairly young Adventist. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember being a young Adventist. Well, he still has that glow and that spirit <laughs> uh, about him. And, and, uh, and you can't say anything about it. Just look at his wife. She looks so adoring at him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> she does. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and I think he looks the same way back at her. I like to see that. I admire them a lot. Russ, come on. Come on up. Tell us your story. God bless you. And you know I love you. I know it, Brother Tom. First of all, I'd like to send, or I should say, I'd like to convey the greetings from Bobby McGee, who was here last week. And he and I talked just the day before yesterday, and he was just thrilled to death with the reception here. And he's so looking forward to February 22nd, next year, being marked on the calendar. And then, Viola was going to be here tonight, but yet we've moved her to the 23rd of this month. So Brother Tom asked me to kind of step to the plate, if it were, and give a little story about my life. My life started in a small town of Cottage Grove, Oregon. I know a young lady right over here that knows all about Cottage Grove, don't you, Kathy? I do. <laughs> the doctor that delivered me was the same doctor that delivered her brother and took her tonsils out. <laughs> so it is a small world. Amen. But at the time I was young, my father left. My mother, she was pregnant with my sister. I'm the oldest. So I never knew my natural father. My mother remarried, and I can relate to any of those children that have ever been through physical abuse. I was beat unmercifully for a number of years. It was only due to an uncle stepping in that stopped the abuse. And the next thing I knew, I was living with my grandparents. 
I had nightmares for years. I didn't know which way to turn. But through the time my mother, she remarried, we were in the Eugene, Oregon area. <clears throat> and talking to some of the young neighbor kids, I'm talking six, seven years old, they were telling me about Jesus. So that was an old bus that would come through the neighborhood on Saturday or on Sundays and pick up the children and take them to church. Well, I started attending church. And I learned a lot about Jesus as a child. And then went on into my teenage years. I actually attended church camps. At one time, I was voted the outstanding camper and given a scholarship for the next season. As I graduated high school, two days after I graduated high school, I was standing at Fort Ord, California, and I was in a medical battalion. Once I got out of the service, I returned to Eugene, and I ended up marrying a high school classmate who at the time told me, well, she had been raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I said, well, I'm Christian, that don't bother me. In 1973, I became one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I've always loved the Lord. I've always loved our God. Amen. I threw myself into it full bore. It wasn't too long I was a ministerial servant in the congregation. Later, I was appointed as an elder in the congregation. The elders oversee the operation of the congregation under a presiding overseer. I have served as a presiding overseer in a number of congregations. I was involved in a building projects, something like the Maranatha projects that the witnesses have. The witnesses build quick built kingdom halls. You've probably heard of that. I had the privilege of serving with two other individuals and we designed and put together a kingdom hall of 4,000 square feet. We had a cement slab on Saturday morning. 36 hours later, it was finished with the pews in it and operational. Amen. Landscaping, everything completed in 36 hours. We had over 600 workers and we worked them in shifts of the various degree that we needed, the carpenters, the electricians, the sheetrock. So we worked around the clock. Uh, the inspector had never seen anything like that. We paid overtime for that. Today, there are roughly eight and a half million <coughs> witnesses worldwide. There are over 62,000 kingdom halls worldwide. Most of them have three congregations using each kingdom hall. They try to keep the kingdom halls down to about 150 people. My own view of that is why so small? As my wife and I have talked about it, I, I believe it's because of control. They have better control over the individuals that attend those kingdom halls. I have put in thousands of hours of going and knocking on doors. My nose is short because I have had hundreds of doors slammed in my face. But yet I have met a number of wonderful Christians of various denominations where I've had wonderful studies with them. Amen. Maybe tomorrow I'm even going to be blessed with an individual coming here. Just because of a situation 
that I started talking to this individual in a checkout line at Staters. I never, never let a time go by that if the opportunity is there, I take it. And she lives just down the street. And so I invited her and uh, we'll see if she shows up tomorrow. Anyway, with the witnesses, I got into a point where, like I say, I was an ordained minister. I performed funerals and weddings and so forth. I'm licensed in the state of Oregon. But as I read the Bible, and that's one thing the witnesses do, they, they suggest you read the Bible, get to know it. Well, the more I read it, the more I found inconsistencies in what they were teaching and what I was believing. We'll take just a few, just the Sabbath issue. As I would ask a question, oh, that's just something that we go by for convenience for this day and age. But that's not what the Bible says. We're to keep the Sabbath. Amen. Amen. And so there was one issue, the blood issue, about abstaining from blood. Mm -hmm. I know you're familiar with the individual prince that just died not long, too long back because of a drug overdose, prescription drugs. He was one of the Adventists and reverted over to becoming a witness. He needed his hips replaced because of all the years on stage and all that. But he refused blood and he lived on the pills and that's what his demise was. Again, being military, I believe in that flag. Amen. I believe in this country. Amen. I have had a number of family members that have died for our freedom. The witnesses do not recognize the flag, do not salute the flag, and to me, totally disrespect it. That was another issue that came to my mind. Another one that really hits home is the issue of disfellowshipping. If someone does something wrong, they are cast out of the congregation. They are shunned to have nothing to do with them. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what our Savior Christ says, as we'll say it, talk a little later. But I'd like to read the scripture for you. If you have your Bibles, if you, if you wanna look at this particular scripture, it's in 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, and verses 13 through 15. And it says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now, I'm not saying that all witnesses are bad. I'm not condemning any one of them because there's many fine, fine individuals, but they are sorely misled. We have someone here that is twisting the scriptures. They're not putting the truth out there. But back to me. 
I had a very dear friend in Vancouver, Washington that I am very close to to this day. They are Adventists. Their children have went through, well, she went through the Columbia Academy. Their children have all went through medical aid and into the Columbia Academy. He went to school down here near San Diego, but we've become very, very good friends. And in our community of Riderwood, i become very good friends with one John Mailing. Amen. Very fine man. Yes, Many of you here knew John. I work with John around our community and various community projects and all that. I even worked on John's house and Marlene's house and helped him with projects there. So we became very good friends and when he wanted something he'd run down the street three houses and ask for help. I became acquainted also with others in town. Bev and Jerry Brass, Amen. Don and Lola Ham, Amen. the Stroms, and the Horners, all these individuals. Mary Goff, who lived next to Marlene. John had passed away, and a little later, my wife, my second wife, had passed away. My first wife passed away, and when she passed away, I walked away from all organized religion. I walked away for 15 years. And my wife, my second wife, was not a churchgoer, but she passed away there in Riderwood. Now really begins my journey to where I am here today. We've often heard how God works in mysterious ways. Amen. We don't know what's going to happen. I would have never a thought in my life that a van full of handicap equipment would start me on a journey. A journey that brought me here tonight. John's niece needed some handicap equipment moved down here to Desert Hot Springs for John's two sisters. She asked Marlene if she knew of anybody that might drive the van down and she would fly them back. Marlene knew that at one time I had helped another lady take some stuff to San Diego in a U-Haul after her husband passed away. And so she asked me, and I said, well, yeah, I'm not doing anything. So we met and talked with Jan. The next thing I know, uh, Jan says, well, Marlene, why don't you ride down with Russ? I've got a car down there you can have for the season, and you won't have to drive down by yourself. So we packed up and came down here. I spent a few days down here. It seemed everywhere I went around Desert Crest, I was associating with retired pastors. Amen. I mean, whether I was up at the pool, it was Willis Adams, it was Jerry Brass, all of them. It was one I dearly call Muddy Waters. There's a inside story behind that, an old railroad man, but anyway. But I met so many individuals, and Marlene had handed me a book, 
and we had talked a, a little bit, but she handed me a book on the greatest caveman. Mm -hmm. And I stood in front of that window looking at that mountain, San Jacinto, and reading that book and was just enthralled with it because I'm an outdoor person. I couldn't put it down. Well, I flew back home. Cold, miserable. It was terrible up there. Me and the dog in a big house. Well, Marlene and I talk several times a day. And she says, well, why don't you come back down? I have a second bedroom. You know everybody down here because they were up there. And I said, well, I don't know. Finally, I said, okay. So I came down and again, associating with the individuals that I was associating with and going up to the Wednesday night Bible study and her and I had talked because the difference between Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses and wherever we went, people were saying, man, you two just, oh, you really have it going on. And I mean everywhere we went. And I told that's the one thing I told her. I said, I will never ever come between you and your creator. I said, it's not my place. You've lived this life. This is what you believe. I said, I'm open to looking. But uh, anyway, we decided to slip off and get married. Amen. Uh, we had first we had talked to a number of individuals. Uh, John Bilbro and all. So we had some counseling and some talks and all that. But that transpired and kind of leads me to where we're at today. I came to this congregation. I remember the first Vespers I attended, that I can really remember I attended. And Rico Belugo was here. Amen. And he really struck a chord with me. And as I say, he kind of put some kindling on the fire. On Sabbath, he was sitting over here. He saw me sitting back there. He come running down that side aisle and sat down and he and I chatted for about five minutes. Had never met the man before. And we became very, very close friends out of that conversation. Shortly after that, Bobby McGee was going to be here. Marlene started telling me all about Bobby McGee, and I said, no, 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 don't say a word. I said, let me make up my mind. As we know, Bobby is a little outside the box. Amen. <laughs> but, so am I. Amen. I may dress a little different than he does, but he and I, that was... He really threw gasoline on the fire that Reuben had started. And through the studies I was going here. And he and I, we keep in touch. Every couple weeks, Bobby and I are on the phone just to check and see how each other's doing. We've become that close. And like I said last week, when he goes up to Sunnyside, we go see him at Sunnyside there in Portland. And then down here, up there, down here. But then we got back to Riderwood and we're attending church in Chehalis. And one Jerry Brass says, well, we're going to have a Bible study at our house. And we'd like you to come. And between him and Don Ham, kind of taking me under their wings, and talking to me and teaching me. Amen. We were in the book of Revelation and it came to the point where 
it talks about sometimes a second baptism is warranted. Jerry was sitting there and I'm sitting next to him. I always try to sit next to him because I'm hard of hearing and he's very soft spoken. And he says, you know, Russ, he says, I've been talking to Pastor Dave about you. And I held up my book, was written out, my feelings and all that, and I'll never forget the look on his face. That he knew what I felt. He read what I felt. That I felt that I was ready to make some decisions. So I met with Pastor David Glenn, wonderful, wonderful man. We had several studies together. We went for walks in the woods together and just got out in nature. Marlene uh, tagged along. But we had some great times. So it came to a point, October 8th, it was now going on two and a half years ago, decided that that would be the time that I would be baptized. We were headed to church on Sabbath morning, out through the farm area that we go out through on Wildwood Drive. I've always been a collector of eagles. And when I lived in the San Juan Islands, I actually trained eagles to come out and take fish out of my hand. Mm -hmm. Wonderful creatures. I'm doing 55 miles an hour down the road. Out of nowhere, this huge, mature bald eagle come right up over the driver's fender, turned, flared, and went straight up. And I'm in awe. My wife was sitting there and she says, what just happened? And we got to the church. And I'm sitting there and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I don't know why, except the Lord stepped in. A scripture popped in my head. I'll never forget it. Exodus, the 19th chapter, and the fourth verse. And if you look that up, it states, I will bring you to me on the wings of eagles. Amen. And I knew right then and there, I had made the right decision. I truly knew that what I was seeing, what I was believing, was the Adventist way of life. And I have tried to work and live that life. As you say, I'm young. Here I am associating with and even have been asked to conduct some of the Bi a Bible study up there. I'm looking out at all these individuals that have been to seminaries and colleges and have all these degrees and are past pastors and ministers. I'm just a high school graduate. Mm -hmm. What I've learned, I've learned because of my study and what the good Lord has given me. Amen. And I thank every one of the individuals that have taken me under their wing, including our God and His Son, Christ. Amen. But that's enough about me for a little bit. How about... We have another little story. I'm sure you're familiar with it, but on a night like this, with a storm brewing and everything coming in, 
I think it kind of fits. I'm sure the scriptures will refresh your memories. But let me tell you the story. The story is about a farmer. We'll call him Farmer Brown. It was getting on into summer. And he wasn't able to keep up with everything that he was doing. And his wife said, well, why don't we go into town, hire a man, have him come out and help you. And he said, well, that sounds pretty good. So off to town they went. They arrived in town. They found that all the help had been hired. They could, didn't find anybody. But as they were driving around, they saw an individual standing in front of the hardware store. Farmer Brown approached this individual and asked him if he was looking for work. And the individual said he was and he introduced himself as John. And the farmer asked him what his credentials were, what his qualifications were. John simply replied, I can sleep on a windy night. <laughs> Farmer Brown couldn't figure out what John was talking about and what he meant. But after talking to his wife, he decided to go ahead and hire John. He figured, well, I can always fire him if he's lazy. But John turned out to be an excellent worker. He was up early. He worked all day hard in the fields. John only had one problem. John was always late for dinner. And that irritated Farmer Brown. But he let it slide because John was such a hard and valuable worker. Well, one night, a terrible storm came and as the wind howled and the trees swayed, old Farmer Brown woke up and he went to wake up John so that they could go out to the barn and make sure everything was put together and see it was okay. But he couldn't wake John up. So he ran out to the chicken pen. Everything was fine. Chickens were on the roost. He ran to the barn. The doors were all shut. The shutters were shut on the barn. The cows were chewing their cut. The horses were in their stall. He thought about the sheep. He went to the sheep pen. Everything was fine in the sheep pen. Boy, what about all that hay that we put up today and all that? It's going to blow everywhere. He ran around the barn. It's all tarped, staked down, tied down. Now Farmer Brown learned what John had said and what he had meant when he said he could sleep on a windy night. So Farmer Brown went back to bed. He was happy as can be that he had chosen John to be the individual to work for him. But my question is, to each and every one, can you sleep on a windy night? Because as we know, there is a storm coming. You can feel it. The morning sky is red. It brings to mind the old rhyme. And what's that? Red sky in the morning, sailor take warning. Red sky at night, sailor come We've all heard that many, many times. But the storm that's brewing is more truth than fiction. As the day wears on, the wind begins to pick up, the dark clouds are rolling in. The thunderheads are rising thousands of feet up to the heavens. 
blinding flashes of light pierce through the clouds, make them actually look like they're alive. And I don't know how many of you might have been in a position where all of a sudden the lightning and the thunder rolls right over your head. I have been there. I had that happen to me just a year and a half ago in Usulius when a lightning bolt was like right beside me as I was getting in the vehicle right after Marlene got in. I got in and I was shaking like this. But this thunder as it rolls across, it's just like a big drum crashing. Your heart's beating. And I know I felt that at that time. You can actually see, you can actually feel, and you can actually smell that storm in the air. And I'm sure you've all smelled the air after a rain or after a storm. There's a different smell. Or in a lightning storm, you can actually smell the burnt nitrogen in the air. But the harder the storm blows, the gusts are getting really steady. It's pushing harder and harder for longer periods of time. The lights begin to flicker. The electricity goes out as all power fails. Against this unforeseen force of nature that's pushing in. And as I said, lightning and thunder going on over her head. It's crashing so close that it's actually shaking the foundation of the house that you're in. The window glass begins to rattle. Some of it shatters and breaks. The shutters bang and give way. Angry green clouds mixed with the black and the gray clouds make it an awesome look. Long fingers reach out of the heavens toward the earth, trying to grab chunks of it and grasping anything in its path. And we've all seen the pictures of the tornadoes and how they work. As you look at this storm coming, you can tell this is really going to be a bad one. It really is. But the question is, are you ready for this storm? Have you battened down all the hatches and secured all the doors? And how about your brothers and sisters? How would your family be? How would it survive? Are you an individual that can sleep on a windy night? Consider, if you will, that this storm that's on the horizon is God's great coming. Would your house fare well? Have you done everything possible to save your family, to save your loved ones? Or do you hear the individual that just thinks, yeah, everybody's going to be okay. It's no big deal. Or are you truly prepared for the worst? Or are you the individual that's halfway prepared? Or maybe just a little bit prepared? Maybe you're the individual that's waiting for tomorrow. Now, tomorrow could very well be too late. Amen. The scriptures have stories and parables 
for our use in these last days. They encourage us to be fully prepared for this greatest of storms is to take place. Nothing should ever left to be unprepared. Nothing left to chance or left to become that surprise, failure. Due to our doing nothing at all. And here, we could have actually prevented that destruction of ourselves and our family. Each and every one of us, as we know the scripture tells us, we are all precious children of God. Amen. Every one of us sitting here, or myself standing here. But faith is the key that inspires us, inspires us to be prepared. Faith in our God, faith in His Holy Spirit, and yes, even faith in ourselves. Faith that we have, have that there is a God. We have that faith. Faith that He loves us as individuals. And faith that He is a God of love. We're told that our bodies, each one of us, and you look, there's a number of individuals here, but each one of us is a blessed temple in which God's Spirit resides. Amen. Every one of us. we can actually make better use of these blessed gifts that we're given, the talents that we're given. He has given us these gifts and these talents for us to reach our full potential. And did you know that Jesus' apostles had to learn even stronger faith. We can go to another storm. Scripture's a little lengthy, but let's go to Matthew, the 14th chapter. Let's consider verse 23 through 34. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves from the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, Bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried, saying, Lord, save me. 
And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, and he caught him. And he said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore dost thou doubteth? And when they were when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Genest Boy, Genestet. But anyway, here we see that Jesus went up into the mountains, the wilderness, and I can relate to this because we have a special place in Riderwood. It's called the Redwoods. People do not even know that it exists. It's just a short walk out of Riderwood, up a logging road. Very majestic redwood forest. And as you walk into it, there's a path that goes up the center of it. And I call that my cathedral. And I love to go up there and spend time and recharge my batteries. And Jesus here, this is what he was doing. He was recharging his soul when he went into the wilderness there. He did this many times. And on returning to his apostles by way of walking out there across the waters in this big, fearful windstorm, we see how lack of faith or the belief in faith can actually lose or save our soul. Here we see, even though Peter came to the point of doubting his faith, without hesitation, Jesus reached out to him when Peter asked for it. When he called upon Jesus, Jesus was there instantly. No hesitation. How often do brothers or sisters, sons or daughters, or friends make mistakes? We all make mistakes. But are we willing to reach out without hesitation? To help them before they begin to sink. Jesus didn't wait until Peter was under the water, drowning, when Peter asked, Jesus immediately reached out, took hold of him. This is another wonderful example of the ultimate love as displayed by Christ. For us to use the same type of love anytime in our daily lives when we can actually help someone if at all possible. And Jesus didn't continue to beat Peter or put him down any way, shape, or form. He didn't chastise him because of his lack of faith or for his doubt. And we too should follow that same example. Once taking hold of Christ's hand, Peter was able to return to that ship, to that boat. Faith once again restored. The storm actually subsided. 
And Peter came to a stark realization. You know, I'll bet Peter knew from that night on that he could sleep soundly on any windy night. Amen. The next parable is again in the book of Matthew, the 25th chapter. In the 25th chapter, verses 1 through 13, again, now we're actually hearing Jesus speak. And he begins, Then shall the kingdom of the heavens be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil for our lamps. Ours are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so. Least there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather unto them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, and the bridegroom came, and they were ready, they went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterwards came also other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, ye know neither the day nor the hour whereupon the Son of Man cometh. <coughs> so the question would be, will I, Will you be ready? Will Jesus recognize you? Will you, your family and loved ones, all have their lives in order? Will your boat of faith be strong be seaworthy, be built good and solid? Will your lamp be filled as well? So as you step out tonight and you look around at what's going on, and there's a storm coming over the mountains. You can see it as we came in. Can you sleep? on a windy night. Thank you. Would you, if you would, join with me in a word of prayer. If you'd like to stand. Our wise and loving Father, we humbly come before you this evening in your household. Again, we pray that your spirit be with each member here tonight. May we ponder over the things that uh, we've heard. May we look at ourselves, look at our families, our friends, our associates, to see that we are prepared because we know 
that day is so very near, Father, and we need your support, your direction to guide our footsteps. May we continue to serve you in a way that is right and proper as we're waiting for that day to arrive. May you bless each of the individuals that was unable to meet with us this evening. We know there's a lot of sickness going on and there are a lot of friends that are having difficult times. But again, Father, we thank you for the time that we've had here together. I personally thank you for bringing me into this wonderful congregation and being a short time member of it. But what a joy it is to be a part of your united family, to know that I have come to know the truth. Amen. And that truth has set me free. Amen. Amen. Amen.